Today we are in John chapter 10, and I know that uh, many of you know that we, we've been uh, going through this series called Name Above All Names, and I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there may be a lot of names thrown around tonight at the Super Bowl. They may talk about the, the Super Bowl rings and the quarterback and the running back, said, but I got news for you. There's one name that's above every name they may mention, and that is the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, who died on the cross, for us, that's the name that's above every name. doesn't matter what commentator and how many rings he has or what Hall of Fame he's in. My name is in the Lamb's Book of Life because of Jesus Christ, because of His name. His name is above all names. Ooh, I just might get stirred up and start preaching this morning. We are looking at the I Am statements because we understand that Jesus is revealing something about who He is when He says, I Am. And it ties back to the Old Testament when Moses was standing before the, the, the burning bush and he says, well, who am I going to tell them that sent me? And God replies, I am that I am sent you. And so as Jesus is saying, I am, that essence of saying, I am God is right in that statement of saying, I am. But then he follows it up with different things. And, and so far we've heard about, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the light. And today we come to another I am statement. I am the door. As I think about doors, there are many things that, that come to mind. How many of you have ever watched Let's Make a Deal? Oh, I see hands going up everywhere. In Let's Make a Deal, you dress up like a crazy person. Or you just dress up like you just don't care what other people think. That's, that's what it is. You just don't care what other people think. And so you, you dress up crazy. They call you up. And so they'll offer you some things. So would you like what's behind what door number one? Or would you like what's behind door number two? I'll give you $500 to trade in door number one for door number two. It's all about a door, isn't it? And there's a prize on the other side of that door. There are many ways that we refer to doors. We, we, we say crazy things like, well, that was just a closed door in my life. Or, that's an open door. We use doors in our vernacular, don't we? We have doors at our homes and our places of business. Sometimes you go to a place or you're driving through a neighborhood and you may not realize this, but there is one particular color that if a door is painted this color, it means hospitality. It means openness. It means care. You want to know what color that is? Who knows what color you paint a door for hospitality? It's the color red. A red door means hospitality. Doors have different colors. They have different styles. I guarantee you everyone in this room has a door in your house. How many of you have more than one door? Uh, that's, that's, that's what I thought. We all have doors around us. How many of you walk through a door to get in the church? Come on, everybody's hand better go up on that one. Come on now. Doors are all around us. They are everywhere. Doors are important in our life. They serve certain purposes. And when it comes to closed and open doors in our life, we often find ourselves in a position where life will get scary and things come up and we don't know how to deal with stuff. And we don't know if it's an open door or a closed door. We don't even know. We can't even describe the door going on in our life that's set before us. But we come to a question. Where do we go? Where do we go? How do we get from where we are to where we really want to be? And more importantly, where God would want us in our life in the midst of all the stuff happening. How do we go from here to there? And sometimes people will even ask this question. If I pray... Will God even hear my prayer? Is He even listening to me? Does He hear what I've been saying? I've been praying and it seems like He's not opening a door. It seems like the doors are staying closed. You've probably heard that. So I want us to examine doors today a little bit. As many of you know, I like illustrations. I like things that we can see, things that we can touch. And I wish I could have found a door today. I'd love to have put a door on the stage so you could see the door, so that I could touch the door, I could knock on the door, I could be near the door. But, lo and behold, there is one right over here. This is a door. Someone just said it's a pretty door. I'm sure on your house you probably have a pretty door. 
this door is very unique because it is an outside door. Do you know that there's a difference between an outside door and an inside door? Mr. Hoyt does. He can explain all the little details to you after service if you want to know. But an outside door is going to be reinforced. It's going to be stronger. Why is an outside door reinforced and stronger? Keeps out the bad guys. It protects us, right? This door is here for protection. Now, we have a door at our house, and it just cracks me up. All right. I'm a little afraid to share this. Our back door at our kitchen is a window from here to here, from there to there. All a person would have to do is walk up with a hammer and go, bam, and they could be in our house. I don't understand building doors that way. But anyway, it's, it's nice we can, see out, we can see out. But the outside door is always reinforced. It's heavier. It's stronger. It's built for protection. Doors are there for other reasons. For like privacy. When you're at home with your family, you just wouldn't want somebody to just walk in off the street and say, Hey, what y'all doing? What y'all watching? Can I have some of those? You know, you wouldn't want people just walking into your house. So we have doors to give us a boundary to say this is us don't just come walking on in here especially on a Saturday morning about 8 30 when you're still in your pajamas and all of a sudden you hear at the door everybody be quiet we're not here shh be still don't go away <laughs> you ever been there some of you have the do- I see it in your face. You're going, hey, that's a good, good trick. The door is there to protect us, to give us our space, and to keep us from the things that are on the outside that's bad. We don't want bad guys just walking into our house and just carrying out our t- TV and take out our Xbox. I mean, how in the world is my son going to play Fortnite if he doesn't have his Xbox? I mean, he would have eight hours a day he wouldn't know what to do with. <laughs> Some of you just got that. Oh, I love you, buddy. Um, but a door, is, a door is important in our life, and we have one on our, on our homes. It is there. We often have a lock put on that door so that we can close it and leave and know that no one's going to get in. At your house right now, I guarantee you that, that 99% of the people in this room, probably if I went to your house right now, I could not just walk up, grab the doorknob, open it, and walk in your house. Because you probably have it. Locked. There was a time, even in this village, where people left their door unlocked. You'd walk up to a door and there wouldn't even be a place to put a key. They didn't need it. They didn't need it. But now today we live in a time where we need this protection. We need this outside access into our homes. And we need a way to get out of our house to go get provisions for ourselves. To take care of our our families, our homes. As we think about doors, they're all around us. And I hope today that as you leave, when you see a door, you see it a little differently. Because we will find here in John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says something. He says, so Jesus said to them again, truly, truly. Now when he says truly, truly, he says, listen up. Make sure you pay attention. I say to you, And he says these words, I am the door. Now, if you have an NIV, it says, I am the gate. And I'll explain to you why the NIV would say gate instead of door in just a moment. And you're going to begin to understand a little bit more about what Jesus means when he says, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 8, all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. We're coming off the heels of the blind man being healed at the pool of Siloam. Jesus heals him. He tells him to go. He goes and washes. He is healed. He goes to the temple. They're, they're, you know, People are excited. Other people are confused. They're trying to figure out, is this guy the same guy? It is the same guy. The Pharisees begin to ask him, how did this happen? He says, well, this guy, Jesus, he healed me. He told me to go do this, and Jesus healed me. They didn't like that. 
So after pressing into him and him going, look, do you want to know about Jesus? Do you want to come and be his disciple too? All I know is this. I once was blind, but now I see Jesus changed my life. And you know what the Pharisees did? Get out of the church and don't ever come back. You're no longer allowed to walk into the synagogue. You have been excommunicated. Today in our life, when we proclaim Jesus, we will be pushed out and pushed away. But here is a man rejected and pushed away. And then Jesus begins to teach. Jesus goes and finds him, talks with him. He is a disciple of Jesus. It's a beautiful story in chapter 9. And in chapter 10, as he is talking and he's teaching, he begins to say things like verse 2, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. What does he mean by these ideas of the door? When we begin to to, uh, figure out this whole door thing, well, you know, we know that as we look at the door, in our own life we can draw, draw some conclusions. There's many things that we could say about a door. But I think there's three things I want you to get today. That it's a word for someone who's here about Jesus being the door. Today, to fully understand what Jesus is referring to, as Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, which we're going to talk about next week, I am the good shepherd, what did he mean by that? He is using the illustration of sheep, and he's referring to something called a sheepfold. There should be a picture that I want to put up on the screen for you to look at for a second. This picture of a sheepfold would be a large area that would be uh, created by stones. And it was high enough that sheep would not jump over it. And usually on top of it, they would often put like like thorns and thistles and sharp rocks and, and dangerous things on the very top. You want to know why they did that? Somebody want to guess? To keep the animals out. Keep it safe. Keep the sheep safe so there wouldn't be a wolf that would climb up there and get in and and hurt the animals. Or so a thief would not climb in, kill a sheep, and then throw it over and steal it. So this particular sheepfold, as it was called, would be built. There would be one near the town that many shepherds could bring their their, their flocks. And, and the, the, the door was just open. There wasn't anything there. It was just an open spot where the sheep could just walk right on in. And they'd gather around in there. And they, they needed this because oftentimes the shepherds, you know, they do need to sleep at some point. But their, their care and concern for their sheep is they don't want anything to happen to the sheep because the sheep... They don't have sharp claws. They don't have sharp teeth. They can't run very fast. They don't have a good way of defending themselves. That's why shepherds were so important to sheep. Shepherds, during the day, would watch out for the sheep. And when the shepherd would see an animal or something coming, that shepherd would grab his staff and he'd grab his stuff and he'd run out there. And he'd, Do you remember the story about David in the Old Testament where David was a shepherd and he killed a lion and a bear? Let me tell you something. That's one bad mamma jamma to me. I have never killed a bear and I've never killed a lion. And you know what that tells me? There were lions and bears in the area. Think about that. In Israel, in this area, we often see these things on on TV and we think, okay, lions are in Africa or, or, or they're at the zoo in Atlanta. Lions roamed the area where Jesus lived. That's why Peter writes that, that, that the devil walks around like a roaring lion. How do you think those people understood what he meant by roaring lion? They didn't visit the local zoo. They had heard lions roar and they knew how dangerous and the chills that went over them when they heard that. So there were lions in the area. And the shepherd needed a place to take their sheep so their sheep would be safe at night so they could actually sleep. Sometimes instead of the city, if they were out in the country, they would build one. And they'd have a place where they'd take their sheep and let their sheep go in there. And their sheep would go in there and they'd settle down. And you want to know what the shepherd would do? The shepherd would go to the opening. And that's where he would stay all night. And by being at the opening, no sheep could go out of that enclosure without the shepherd knowing it 
And no animal could come in through that opening without the shepherd knowing him. And oftentimes, the shepherd would lay down to go to sleep. Now, I want you to think about what the shepherd's doing at that moment. I am putting myself at the tip and the point of death to protect my sheep. The shepherd is saying, I am standing between my sheep and death. And he would often lay down and go to sleep, ready at any moment. Jesus says, I am the door. He says, I laid down my life for my sheep. Understand visually what everybody heard that day. He was talking about that shepherd that would lay down in the door and become the doorway. The difference between death and life. So the first thing I want us to talk about with the door is that it provides access. It provides access. As we look in verse 7, as he refers to himself as the door, he says, I am the door. In verse 9, he says, I am the door. Both of these are referring to it. It's going from one side to the other, is it not? I mean, who in the world is going to have a door sitting like the one over here to my left in their home or around them? That door... It has nothing. It leads nowhere. It just goes from one little spot on the stage to the other. There's no walls. There's nothing to enclose it. But normally and typically, a door is there to give access from one room to another. I mean, we've got French doors. We've got uh, doors, just the, the, the thin doors at your house. Many of you have that they're white and they got the different panels and we've got doors that are different colors we got different kinds of doors but the door is always there to give us access to something else whether it's the kitchen the bedroom the bathroom it, or something it gives us access the doors on this church gives you access to come inside a door Jesus is saying that he is the door he is the access to heaven When you think about that picture a while ago, there's only one opening. And there's only one that's there at the door. And that is Jesus. He is the access into eternal life in heaven. Many people say, well, that's narrow-minded. There's a lot of ways to heaven. No, there's only one. It's Jesus Christ. He declares He is the way, the only way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. you got to go through something to have a door. Jesus is our access to eternal life in heaven. He's our access to have life here on earth. It's not just simply about having a a, a ticket stamp to get into heaven. It's about having life here and now in this world to have life. See, if these sheep did not have a shepherd that became a door for them, they would become lunch for somebody or a midnight snack. They needed that door. They needed that shepherd so they could have life each and every day and have it more abundantly. And I want you to think about this third thing. Not only about eternity in heaven and not only about life here and now, but without Jesus Christ, you could pray from now till till next week and God would not hear a word you said. It is through Jesus Christ we have access to call on His name. He hear our prayers and He'll do something about it. Without Jesus, you would never be able to call on His name. Thus why, when we pray, O Father, help us. Get through this or do this. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name. You know what you're saying? I'm walking through the door of Jesus. Because Jesus is the access to God the Father. Jesus intercedes for us. He is the door into heaven for us when we pray. So Jesus, the door, provides access. And can I tell you something? Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. You want to make the enemy afraid and scare and run in the other direction? You just go to Jesus. Get on your knees and begin to pray through Jesus' name and that enemy will have to run the other way because all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute, I ain't tangling with that guy. The enemy will go, no way. 
The wolf will run the other way. The lion knows maybe this isn't a great idea because the shepherd is there and the shepherd's not afraid to take on the enemy, the evil one. Let me tell you something. Don't take on the enemy by yourself. Don't try to do it in your own power. Do it through Jesus. Prayer is weakness leaning on omnipotence. That's what W.S. Bowd said about prayer. We can access the mighty power of God through Jesus Christ in prayer. That's why if anybody ever asks me to pray in public, I hope one day I get to pray on TV. I hope I'm in front of Congress. I hope everybody in the world gets to see me because I guarantee you one thing. When you watch, you're going to hear me say, In Jesus' name. Because if I don't say in Jesus' name, my prayers were nothing but words because I didn't stamp it with the right. I'm not walking through the right door. I'm not going to pray in God general. I'm praying in Jesus' name. He's the door. The other thing that we notice about the door is it offers protection. We talked about that with an exterior door. It's there to protect us from the elements, from the enemies, from the dangers. The door protects us. Verse 9. Verse 9, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Saved. He will be safe. Earlier, he even said in verse 8, All who come before me are thieves and robbers. There is an enemy that wants to steal from you the joy of God's salvation. There is an enemy that wants to destroy your family, wants to destroy your community, wants to destroy everything you've ever thought precious. He wants to rip it apart. He don't want the good things to happen because then, lo and behold, if you start saying, thank you, Jesus, he just hates it. But wherever there is a faithful flock, there will be enemies waiting to attack from the outside. This is a faithful flock. You guys and us here all together are serving the Lord, striving for what He wants, looking at what His will is according to Scripture. We're not looking simply at what what we like or we don't like or what makes us comfortable or not comfortable. But I'm here to tell you, as we do that, the enemy starts going, now wait just a second, I don't like that going on over there. I've heard from several minister friends. One in particular who actually serves here at this church, Larry, he'll often call me. And he'll say, do you understand that Chicopee is different? It's weird. Because I'm talking to all my friends about their church and they're in a mess. There's fighting. There's things going on. That's just the, the church is falling apart. Uh, and, and I just say, praise Jesus. It's because all of you are following after Jesus. You understand the door is Jesus. That's our target. Our target is Jesus in His direction and will in our life. And I praise God for that. See, the shepherd risked his own life to the point of death for his sheep. When Jesus said, I am the door, Jesus assumes the role of protector, not you. If there's junk going on in your life and you feel threatened, take it to Jesus. Don't try to handle it yourself. Take it to Jesus and say, Jesus, you handle this. You deal with that. Because my Jesus was there. He was the one that actually just hung the stars also and just created a universe that continually expands. You cannot measure. And he just hung the stars also. It was just no big deal. And if my God, if my Jesus did that, he can handle any of my little stuff. But sometimes I forget that. The third thing about a door is that it brings provision. Look at verse 9 and 10. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now this is very interesting and curious because as we often think about Jesus being the door, many people refer to the scripture that's in Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in and I will... I will sup with him and him with me. And we attach it to salvation. Can I tell you, the context has nothing to do with people being saved. When the scripture in Revelation says, I stand at the door and knock, that is written. Jesus is speaking and writing to born-again believers in a church who has put Jesus on the outside of their church instead of the inside of their church. And he's going, hello, I'd love to be back in there. You've left your first love. It's not about salvation. 
And we look here and we can see that it says that they will go in and out and find pasture. See, here's the beautiful thing. We think of door, a door as being stationary. It's not going to move. It's there, right? You don't want it to just come loose. You don't want it to move. But for this door, when you go in and out of that protection, when you go in and out of that access to that better place, God is right there and you're going to find your provisions that you need. When you're hurting so bad that you just need to go somewhere to find the Lord, Jesus is the answer. He's got your provisions somewhere. He's got what you need and you just need to walk through that door and say, Jesus, supply. See, the use of a triad such as steal, kill, and destroy is often used to make an emphasis. And in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. See, those three makes it worse than just saying the the thief just comes to steal. Whenever you, in Scripture, they emphasize things in threes, that means that he's talking about the immensity of the danger. But Jesus said in verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, this is what God wants. This is what Jesus wants. Jesus desires, he wants He wants to impart abundant life to you. He wants to impart abundant life to you today, right now, in the midst of your circumstances, in the mess of your life. Whatever is going on, He wants to impart life to you. You know what abundant life is. Many of you say, I don't, I forgot what it feels like. Many of you know what it's like to be away from abundant life. But you desire it. You want it. And Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Do not let the devil steal, kill, and destroy the abundantly, the abundance, the joy in your life. Because that's what he wants to do. If, If it's being sucked out, pray against it. Say, Jesus, you be the abundant life that I need. Today, as we look at this scripture, Jesus in his fold, he has a lot of nobody sheep. He has a lot of sheep that thinks they're nobody. A lot of sheep that's been told they're nobody. A lot of sheep that feel like they're failures. But Jesus has them right there. You know something that I think is neat, Miss Gina? Jesus was a carpenter. You know what? I bet Jesus built many times. Jesus probably built doors. Jesus understood how doors were hung. He, knew, he understood how they would swing on hinges and how they had to be just right to keep out the, the weather. Jesus built doors, but yet he says in this scripture, I am the door. You know, Oftentimes, as we look at Jesus, I think we only see him as this great figure who makes a great decoration as a cross. We got to stop seeing Jesus as religion and understand that he is a man who died for us. Jesus is more than just something to make me feel good, Jesus is real. And as we think about what we must do, there's one word that comes to mind, and that is we need to accept Him. We need to accept that Jesus is the door. See, a lot of people accept Jesus as a good person, as a good man. He was a prophet. There's even people in other religions that will say Jesus existed, He was alive, and He was a great prophet. But they will never declare Him the Son of God and the Messiah. It does not change the fact that Jesus is the door. I can stand over here and talk about that door. I can tell you about that door. I can describe to you that door. I can do a lot of things to to really examine that door and have a lot of knowledge. But until I walk through the door, that door does me no good. That door is there. That door is available. That door is real. 
But unless I walk through the door and take advantage of the access it gives me and the protection, the door means nothing. You cannot just simply know Jesus is the way. You cannot just come to church. You can't even be baptized and say, I have access. You have got to say, Jesus, you are the door. And I step in through you. There is no other way. You can't be good enough. You can't get dressed up enough. You can't put on enough makeup. You can't get the, uh, the, the best clothes and get through that door. Jesus is there and that door does not matter how I'm dressed. That door does not matter what I did yesterday or last week or three months ago. All I have to do is accept that that door is there and walk through it. Now here's another little tidbit. This door. If I lock it, I can't get through it, can I? I can't get through that door. What is it going to take for me to get through that door? Somebody said it. I heard it. A key. That's not very big. You want to know what the key to the door is? It's faith. Your faith does not have to be as big as all the mess that you've made in your life and all the stuff that's going on. Your faith just has to be big enough to walk over and unlock the door in faith and let Jesus be that entryway into something greater. An unknown author once said, a very little key will open a very big door. And the key of faith will help you get into the other side. And the other word that I would use, not only accept, is cling. Cling. When I think of clinging, I think of grabbing hold and not letting go. Holding on. With an intensity you know what I'm saying? It's, it's saying, Jesus, I accept what you've done for me. I accept what you said in your word. And now I'm going to hold on to you and I'm going to hold on to it. And I'm not going to let go. When these sheep, when they clung to the shepherd, they were safe. They were safe because the shepherd would take care of them and protect them. Yeah, things would happen. They would get sick. They would get bugs. They would have animals attacked. They may get hurt. But the shepherd was there. They knew the shepherd. H.A. Ironside said, Some think of salvation as if God constructed a peg on the outside of the ark that Noah had to stand on. And if he could hold on through the waves and storms, he would be saved. That's how we think about salvation sometimes. When we think about the ark that, that, that God had Noah build, we, we think of salvation that, you know, I'll be okay if I just stand on this peg outside the, the ship while all the storm is going on. And if I if, if can just hold on long enough, I'll, I'll be saved. No, the salvation came from being on the inside walking through the what? The door. God did not tell Noah to build an ark with three doors. He didn't tell Noah to build an ark with two doors. He told Noah, I want you to build a boat. I want you to build an ark. Here's how big it's going to be, how tall, how wide. And I want you to put one door in it. One door. And every person and every animal that comes through that door will be saved. And those that do not will not be. Salvation isn't simply just trying to hang on. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have victory, ladies and gentlemen. We have access to great power. We have access to great provision. We have great access to care. We have access to talk to God Himself. People, that in itself is praiseworthy. Praiseworthy. Father, we thank You for this morning and, Lord, Your Word and how You have spoken to us How you have given us more clarity of what it means that I am the door, as Jesus said. Lord, thank you for revealing revealing yourself clearer through these different words, these different names that you used. 
Lord, today somebody needs to know that they have access to you. It doesn't matter what they look like or what has happened or what's been going on, that, that you hear in them when they pray and when they cry out because they walk through that door of in Jesus' name. Because that's the authority that, that goes before and after those words. Father, also today, I know that there's probably somebody here who's needing protection from something. They're afraid. They're, they're scared. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. That's what the thief wants to bring is fear. But Father, Jesus, being the door, offers us protection. Lord, I can imagine that some of the sheep, when they first encounter this sheepfold and they walk in, they're probably still afraid. They're probably still scared. Even though they're safe and they're in a place of safety and there's a door, a shepherd who's putting themselves at the, the edge of death for them. God, and it's just like us. Even though your word says it, even though we can proclaim it, some of us are still afraid. So God, may you be that door today that we will know of your protection and today Lord there's some people that just needs something it might be healing it might be peace it might be health it might be it might be uh, Lord financial provisions or it could be be something that they're dealing with in a relationship or whatever it is father I know for a fact you are the provider so Lord may they walk through that door today to say Jesus you're my provider Lord, and we know, we know, we know that without you, we have no access to any of it. So God, if somebody does not, if they've only stood on the outside of the door and talked about Jesus and dressed like Jesus and tried to act like Jesus, but they've never walked through that door of Jesus, God, may this be the morning that they say, Jesus, you are the way, and I need to accept that, and I need to walk through through faith. So right now, Father, as they pray, Father, forgive me and take